Shuk, I co-direct the Center for Internet Law and Policy jointly with my colleague Angela Daly. It's our pleasure to welcome our colleagues uh, Martin Kretschmer, Ula Furgal and Emmy Thomas to present on the topic which has generated immense discussions over the last few years and we will see that obviously the, it's just the beginning of the story. What is interesting about this topic is that they engage in kind of intellectual historiography, designing different discourses of the discussion and trying to analyze them. I had the privilege to, to listen to this paper or some version of this paper in the past. I sincerely enjoyed it and I really look forward to a very productive and stimulating uh, conversation. Uh, without further ado, let me pass the floor to, to, to Martin, I assume. Well, um, hello, everybody. Um, good morning um, across the city. Um, so near and yet so far. Um, and also good afternoon to, I see some European friends on the, on the participant list. Um, so lunch hour has truly arrived there. Um, so thank you. Thank you for making this possible, Oles and uh, Angela. It's um, a great pleasure to be here with my two colleagues, Ulla Fogal and Amy Thomas. And I start by saying a few words really about how this project um, came about. Um, I will run the uh, screen share um, so that there are no interruptions um, and we pass on the slides um, as we go along. So let me see whether I can share the screen. Can I do that actually? Yes, you permitted me. So, um, in our pre-meeting this morning, um, Ulla mentioned that the fourth anniversary of the um, proposal, so the pro directive was proposed since, uh, I think, 16th of September, four years ago, um, and uh, one of the questions we all have is, you know, did we spend four years of our life in, in the right manner? Um, uh, and, and during those four years, you, many of you will, will know that uh, create, uh, create, uh, created a, a resource. Um, essentially, we try to track um, everything that happened. Um, we tracked uh, committee reports, stakeholder submissions, gossip about what happened in the trilogue, um, anything possibly which mattered onto, onto the um, uh, policy uh, formation process. Um, and we did that because we wanted to have an independent academic input I into, into the legislation. Um, and Amy worked on this uh, for a couple of years on this timeline you just see in front of you. Uh, in, in parallel, Ulla uh, wrote her um, uh, PhD uh, in Florence um, on what was in Article 11, um, Press Publishers' Right. So both Ulla and Amy um, you know, uh, were immersed in, in, in primary material relating to the directive um, for years. And um, when the corona lockdown happened, um, we were looking for a, a kind of a, a project uh, where we could uh, collaborate and explore like regularly. And this material um, seemed um, relevant. So, so you don't just collect this and then do nothing with it. Um, so that was really the, the starting point of, of, of this project. Um, um, Amy, do you want to say a little bit how it felt to, to, to work on the um, resource page? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so as Martin said, I was kind of responsible for trying to keep track of this whole mess of information uh, about the directive, which sort of started out as manageable and, and towards the end became decidedly not so. Um, so I was keeping track of all the developments through lots of different sources like news sites and, and, and stakeholder websites, forums, Twitter at times is a very fruitful source of information, but also very heated and toxic at times. Um, despite our best efforts, we were trying to catalogue everything to do with the directive, but inevitably kind of skewed towards Article 13, probably because of the, the nature of the controversy. Um, but as Martin says, Ulla was able to offer us a kind of more valuable and detailed perspective on the other controversial article, um, 11. So I'll pass to Ulla. 
Uh, yeah, as already mentioned, uh, I doubled with Article 11, so the press publisher's rights for my uh, dissertation that I defended earlier this year. So as a part of uh, my research looking into how copyright is expanding uh, to protect news and information, I tracked uh, the discussion of both opponents and proponents of the directive and kind of tried to index all the open letters and uh, statements that were made by stakeholders. Um, so basically the, our data set that we use for this project was combined efforts of Amy and Martin for this website and what I did uh, for my PhD. So we both had a nice database of documents on both article 13 and 11. So we then reflected on what can we do with this material and it seemed to us that we have something which reflected in some sense the public sphere. So we had a window on, on the public discourse and we thought we could investigate whether public discourse really mattered. You know, does it have an effect on lawmaking um, in this specific setting? Um, so the slide you see now is just a, a really a, a quick Google Trends check um, when uh, searches turned up um, in response to um, issues, the, the main controversial issues in the directive. Um, and Amy will say a few words about that. Yep, sure. So this is um, basically just a way of tracking a sort of proxy for public engagement with the, the directive. If you've not used Google Trends before, basically these are showing the relative popularity and relative search volume of searches on Google for a particular phrase, so in this case 11 and 13 um, over the given time period and the region. The score of 100 means it's at peak popularity, 50 half is popular, zero, not enough data. Um, so to the extent that you can kind of treat these searches as a proxy for engagement with the debate and public interest, you can see that there's a definite increase in the popularity of the search terms, which is kind of roughly commensurate with the key dates in the negotiation phase. So you can see the first peak in the 5th of July plenary vote, the second in the 12th of September plenary vote, the trilogue negotiations in November, December 2018, and finally that huge spike at the time of the final vote where it was at its peak popularity. And I think on the next slide, there's an example of Article 11 and 13 side by side. So that's just kind of confirming which we suspected that Article 13 was a vastly more popular search term than 11. So it starts roughly equal, but then come the final vote, 13 basically explodes in popularity. So it's just one way of showing people's engagement with the directive and in particular the articles that they were interested in. So it, it doesn't seem to run. No, it runs again. Okay. So what was the theoretical question we would want asked of, of this material. So we, we identified there is a public discourse, it spikes several times, it spikes at critical points of the lawmaking process. Um, so there were several aspects which are particularly interesting. Um, so one that it seemed to be one of the few instances where we have a, a European public sphere. So one of the criticisms of the European Union often has been that it's not a polity, it's um, essentially national discourses um, and um, there is no European discourse. So what we looked at here seemed to be a European level discourse. Secondly, um, because there was such a good window onto this discourse, it was possible in some ways also to test whether the conditions for public discussion matter for lawmaking. And um, thirdly, we could track possibly with the ambition whether figures which turned up in the discourse could be found in the actual substantive law at the end. So how do we frame this? Um, and uh, we started with you know, the classic theory of, of, of the public sphere, which is Habermas's text from, from 1962, um, which many of you will know as structural transformation. Um, so of the, of, of the public sphere, um, what is, what is core to Habermas's approach is that there are certain conditions of discourse which lead to normative outcomes. So the communication itself, the form of communication itself matters whether the outcome is normatively acceptable. And um, this is part of, I assume, the liberal theory and uh, his approach originally is a kind of a historic stylization. Um, you may 
uh, recognize, for example, the idea of, of coffee houses as a public space. And, and um, so, so, the, so the evolving uh, public sphere under certain conditions of communications then leads to outcome which are justified. Um, there are critiques of, of this approach, you know, that essentially it assumes that we are all equal in, in, in the process of, of, of discourse. And that's obviously a, a kind of enlightenment uh, assumption that, that inherent in argument, there is a, a, a rational assumption. Um, and that doesn't take account of, of social and economic inequalities. Um, and these may persist, uh, particularly in transnational discourse. Um, so it's not straightforward that the Habermasian theory will work. Um, but as a starting point, to, to, I think it, it, it is very plausible. Um, you know, why do we conduct the seminar? Why do we engage in, in rational discussion? If we think, you know, exchange of argument doesn't matter, then why do we do it? So why do academics make submissions into the European policy process? Why do interest groups make submissions? Um, if it's just a reflection of power and the argument doesn't matter at all, um, you know, we are really uh, in a difficult situation. There are some limitations to this approach um, because of the nature of, of our data collection. What we collected is in English. Um, uh, that's justifiable um, if we can show that the European public sphere is really constituted in English. Um, um, and there are many indications why that actually is the case, even post-Brexit, possibly even more so, because English is a, a neutral <laughs> language. Um, so, for example, in, in, uh, in my own uh, uh, home country, I can see, for example, then when a national draft um, of the implementation of the directive was discussed, they made an English translation so that um, it could influence the, the, the European policy process. So, so the assumption that European discourse takes in, in English is, I think, defensible. Um, a, a second limitation is that um, the discourse surrounding the directive um, was not only text-based, and we will see that. Um, it was often visual memes featured uh, in the foreground, and the traditional understanding of, of, of Habermasian discourse is, um, uh, has never been applied to, 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 to that type of interchange. Okay, so this was the, you know, maybe ridiculously uh, ambitious theoretical assumption we, that we could actually, with this specific directive, say something bigger about the conditions for a public sphere. How did we construct the, the data set? Um, you have already seen, essentially, it was a, a three-year process since um, uh, September 2016. Um, and we obviously have the initial con uh, proposal, which then changed over the period of time. Till, uh, to the adoption uh, in, by the European Parliament and then the Council, um, and it was published on the 17th of May 2019. And the primary sources on which we build our content and then discourse analysis are the transcriptions of the parliamentary debates, which coincide with these two of the spikes you've seen, the press releases of the Commission, Parliament and Council, and 80 stakeholder submissions um, uh, relating to uh, Articles 11 and uh, 13, we stick to the old numbers because within, you know, the, the data set we discuss, it has, hadn't been renumbered to 15 and 17. So once these decisions are being taken, we, you know, here we've got a theory, here we've got the data, then you need a research design which um, delivers, and it's actually extremely simple. Ambitious, but simple. So on one hand, you need to know what has changed in the law, you know, between 2016 and 2019. What are the specific doctrinal changes in drafting? And then you have to relate those in some ways to the public discourse. And we do this by firstly a traditional kind of quantitative content, content analysis, so vocabulary frequencies. And then by a deeper discourse analysis through which we identify what we call topoi. That's one particular uh, approach to discourse analysis. And then finally, um, we link you know, the changes in law and the discourse. Um, if it was that simple, um, you know, the paper would be published already. Okay, so now um, I hand over to um, Ulla, who, so we start with step one now. So, so what has actually happened uh, to the proposal relating to the press publishers, right, Ulla? Uh, 
Thank you, Martin. So I will discuss briefly what changes happened to Article 11. So uh, Article 11, as we all know, I hope, introduces a new neighboring right, a related right for publishers of press publications. The right that we had at the beginning in September 2016 was considerably broader than what we ended up having in the final text of the directive. So we started with this right that was effective erga omnes and um, it covered all digital uses of press publications online. And what we ended up having is a right that covers only online uses and uses only by informational society service providers. So not all the users on the internet. And this right also is granted to publishers of press publications. The definition of a press publication didn't change that much throughout the time. But in the end, it's granted only to those publishers who are established in a member state. Uh, some important changes to the phrasing of the right are actually a multiple of carve outs that have uh, been included in the final text of the directive. So the right basically gives uh, publishers of press publications the right of reproduction and the right of making available. However, this right does not cover all hyperlinks. And at the beginning, it was only those links which were not acts of communication to the public. The right also does not apply to single words, very short extracts, and to private and non-commercial uses of individual users. Uh, what is also significant is that the right, uh, the term of the right has been uh, shortened from 20 to two years. So it's kind of a big change in here. And we also have this uh, in the final text of the directive, we have the guarantee of a fair share of the revenues that publishers generate based on this right that needs to be guaranteed to journalists and other authors whose works are included in a press publication. Okay, and so the changes in Article 13 were quite substantive and we saw this sort of relatively simple three section long article change into a very complex and multi-layered provision. So initially the original commission proposal sought to modify the existing safe harbour regime under the e-commerce directive and it was compelling information society service providers to either ensure the functioning of agreements with rights holders or otherwise to prevent the availability of their works on platforms through effective content recognition technologies. Mm -hmm. And at this point, there wasn't much consideration given to um, how non-infringing user-generated works would escape the ambit of this. There was a suggestion of a complaints and redress mechanism. But since that point, there were numerous developments and a lot of them focused on softening this otherwise really explicit starting point. And the finished results very different from the original commission position. And it's an amalgamation of all these developments. So first we have the direct liability for online content sharing service providers. So that's now a subset of the information society service providers who communicate to the public when they give access to protected works. Instead of ensuring the functioning of agreements, we now ask that platforms make best efforts to obtain authorizations from rights holders. And most notably, we don't have that stark language of effective content recognition technologies anymore. It's softened considerably to best efforts and the use of suitable and effective means to ensure that works are unavailable in accordance with high industry standards of professional diligence. We also have the mandatory exceptions for quotation, criticism, review and parody. And we exclude certain platforms depending on function. So not-for-profit encyclopedias like Wiki or on open source software sharing platforms like GitHub. We've got a light version of Article 17 for new and small platforms. So overall, it's quite a transformation, but the key of the original proposal has stayed the same, that platforms either need to agree a license with rights holders or find a way to make their work unavailable, but now with some exceptions. Okay, so now we look at the content analysis very briefly. So initially, we just identified um, by kind of word cloud types uh, uh, investigation, um, the top 12 terms uh, used in each of these sets of uh, data. Um, so you see them here. And then we group them into semantically related uh, groups. Um, and then for each of the lead concept for each group, we then um, dive deeper, deeper and uh, started to investigate in which context they are used. Okay, so we start with a quantitative approach, top 12 concepts, we put them thematically into groups, and then from the lead concept of each semantic group, we look in which context they are operated. Um, and how 
that was done for two of those. Um, well, I will you now show the deep dive for platforms and European. Uh, yes, thank you, Martin. So the first uh, term is the European. So what we have done in here, we went back to the text and uh, basically examined how what the adjective European was describing. And as you see, in total, it was used 226 times to describe 98 different nouns. So it's a plethora of different nouns. So what we did in the next step, it's basically we grouped those nouns uh, based on their meaning. Um, Martin, if you could skip the next one. Yeah, so as you see, uh, when they are grouped, it's uh, way more clear. So the prevalent grouping thing here, um, when the use of uh, a word European is considered, it's a cultural identity. And in here we had such noun as culture, Europeans, citizens, common values, arts, cultural sector, heritage, and so on. And the second grouping was the content business. So who produces content basically. So we had European publishers, producers, broadcasters, but also content itself as film, media, or audiovisual content. So they are the two prevalent groupings in here. Uh, second, when it comes to the, uh, to the word platform, we basically again went back to the text and seen in what sort of phrases the word platform is used. So as you see from the graph, it was used uh, in total 262 times in 43 different phrases. However, the most dominant, as you can see, is actually the use of word platform or platforms by itself. It was total of 131 times, so 50% of the time when the word platform was used was with no other denominator. And second step in this analysis was to see what was the context those phrases with the word platforms were used in. And in here, the most uh, predominant context is this of liability and uh, remuneration and are followed by balancing of interests of different stakeholders. So after we had explored um, these links in the actual discourse, we then reconstructed the, the um, groups into um, for Topoi. And that's an iterative process. So, so if you ever engage in discourse analysis, you try to get as close to the meaning as you can. Mm -hmm. So you, you try to construct something, you review it, and um, uh, essentially we went through a lengthy process, probably two months, where we discussed um, this back and forth. So it's an iterative process, and this is um, an interpretation by the researchers of a discourse. Um, and we constructed four topoi, uh, technocratic value gap, freedom, and European, and we will say quite a bit more about each of those. And then we recoded all the um, initial quantitative uh, analysis in those terms. And just to give you an initial, initial feeling, uh, what the starting point is, essentially all the 12 top frequent words are now allocated to one of those for topoi. And you can see that, for example, the red one is the value gap topos, um, you know, that dominates, for example, you see that immediately descriptively, um, but we come back to all of this. So for now, keep in mind, there are four technocratic, responding to a new technology and removing obstacles to constructing a digital single market. Uh, the value gap, um, which is uh, uh, based on a strange fusion between labor and capital, uh, one could say between the actual creators and authors and the corporations, um, which seem to be uh, articulated as the same interest and seeks a redirection of money. Um, then is the freedom topos, um, which uh, we initially thought would be associated with user interests. Um, and the European topos with a focus on culture and identity and uh, a slightly uh, protectionist uh, undertones. So we now, uh, give you some of what we promised you in the announcement for this uh, talk. Y you know, you want to have some memes. Um, <laughs> so, um, this is uh, Amy. Yes, so the first topos that we're going to talk about um, is that many parts of the debate were technocratic in nature. So there's this drive to address the internet era with updated legislation. So basically, as this meme has kind of concisely interpreted, 
modern problems require modern solutions. Um, and as you can see from the quote on the slides, this is kind of presented as a do or die scenario. Um, the discourse talks frequently about how the internet's changed everything, about how we need an update for the digital era and to address the challenges of the digital age. And more so than this, proponents of the directive talked about this as being very desirable as a position. You're putting Europe at the forefront of the digital revolution and it's to be a world model in the area. So you can be invited to infer that the, the, the directive is basically a necessary intervention against this very abstract and compelling force of digitalness and internet and revolution. So you should support the directive as an objective and rational goal in the face of that. And we'll see that whilst this theme started out as really important at the start of the debate, it started to fritter out as time went on, as more technical changes and disagreements began. So really, whilst everyone agreed that the change was needed, most of the interesting aspects of the debate are about how exactly that change should take place. And now Ulla for our next. Uh, yes, so as Marcin already mentioned, the value gap topoi was quite dominant in, in our discourse. So at the heart of, uh, of this topoi basically lies the idea that creators and creative sectors should be fairly remunerated. So the term value gap itself has been used in the official communications uh, of the EU institutions only once. And the council defined it as a difference between what creators are earning uh, thanks to their works and what platforms, uh, the revenue that platforms are generating, but while using their works. Uh, what is kind, uh, quite interesting is that even though the EU institutions abandoned this value gap language, this language has been consistently used by stakeholders till the end of the debate. Uh, however, the stakeholders usually use the value gap as a term itself only in connection to Article 13, which became to be known as so-called uh, value gap proposal. However, the, the rationale of it, so the calls for the fair remuneration of creators were omnipresent and were going way beyond uh, the discussion on Article 13. Uh, so as a part of this uh, narrative, we see the very negative view of platforms. So platforms are considered to be uh, parasites that uh, steal content, that wield tremendous power, that don't want to share their revenues with uh, creators and uh, creators and creative industries in general. Um, however, uh, platforms are not seen as a monolithic group. So we have this clear distinction that this is only the major big platforms that should share the revenue. And even in uh, communications from the EU institutions, we have the name of tech giants and naming of Google, Facebook and YouTube as those who should pay. And stakeholders basically say they exploit the authors, they should remunerate them. Uh, on the other hand, we have the non-commercial platforms and here names that are repeated quite often are GitHub and uh, Wikipedia that are those good examples that should be excluded from this new regulation. The omnipresent idea is the balance. So there should be a, a creation of a, a level playing field between, uh, between different actors. And the key in here is basically rebalancing the relationship between GAFA, so Google, Amazon, Facebook, um, and Apple, and those who feed them, so our creators. And the goal is to, uh, that creators receive the remuneration, which is described as fair or, or simply proportional or adequate. So the general claim is that creators should be paid. However, this claim is approached differently in connection to Article 13 and connection to Article 11. Because when it comes to Article 13, we have this clear claim that it's platforms that they should receive the fair share of remuneration that platforms are generating. In connection to Article 11, we actually have a proxy uh, in a form of press publishers. So journalists and authors should receive the fair share, but a share of what publishers will get from the platforms. So publishers basically are to negotiate on behalf of authors. Uh, and as a part of, uh, of this value gap topoi, we have a very emotional language when it comes to protection of livelihoods of authors. And one of my favorite quotes is that authors should not be paid via tips. So that's the, the gist of the value gap. And I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to try and get through this quickly. But um, the third topos we looked at was the, the freedoms topos. And to represent this, we have Mr. Freedom himself, Mr. Mel Gibson, is screaming for memes. And I think this is the sentiment that probably resonated the most with protesters and user groups that dubbed the directive the, the meme ban. 
And obviously these types of arguments were really apparent in discourse from the opposition that was often characterised by these ideas and confirms what we sus suspected. But more surprisingly, we found that the discourse from supporters also frequently talked about freedoms. This doesn't mean that they necessarily agreed with the same sentiment. So again, if you look to the slide, you can see the suggestion that freedom in this sense is actually freedom from the tyranny of platforms and freedom to make platforms responsible for their actions. Or as stakeholders put it, not allowing creators to make a living from their work is the real threat to freedom of expression and the free flow of information online. So you can see that they engage with the language of freedom, but for different reasons, they adopt it and turn it into something that ultimately supports an argument to support the directive. And the message becomes that for users, they'll have more freedoms and be better off than if the directive was never enacted at all. And now to Ulla for the last topless. Uh, yes, so our European topoi uh, basically the gist is that we should protect European cultural identity and the analogy that is used a lot is that this David versus Goliath. So we have our uh, Goliaths who are, who are US tech giants who are exploiting the rich cultural heritage of Europe uh, that is created by European authors, European creators, who inherently are on the losing side and are the uh, weakest party when it comes to bargaining. So it's a bit of um, reincarnation of the value gap, um, value gap arguments, but with this European undertone, uh, plus the calls to create, to actually um, a bit of a protectionist approach when it comes to protection of European cultural heritage and diversity. And we also here have this link to the general questions of platform regulation, so regulation of those big, bad uh, American tech giants. And especially one of the links in here is the idea of digital taxation and taxing the platforms. So now we come to the initial findings section. Um, so, so we had the analysis of the legal changes we identified which is an interpretive uh, action. Um, we identified what we believe are the key argumental patterns, which we call topoi. Um, and now, what does the story tell us so far? Amy, do you want to take us through this? Yep, I'll try and be as quick as possible. But um, so what you're seeing in front of you is a, a donut chart that basically shows the weight that's given to each of the topoi across all the different primary sources. Um, so you can see, for example, that um, technocratic as a theme is cited quite frequently in press releases, which by their nature sort of have to show the need for the directive and promote it, um, secondarily by stakeholders in respect of 11 and 13, but much less frequently in the parliament. We think, for example, this is because MEPs showed much more consensus about the need for change and that the debate was focused on the form of those changes. More interestingly, we see that in terms of value gap, it completely dominates most of the sources with the exclusion of the opponents in the European Parliament, which probably confirms what we expected. And we would anticipate that the final text of the directive would be most reflective of this. Um, so unsurprisingly, perhaps the freedoms argument was most prominent with opponents in the European Parliament, which we anticipated. But more surprisingly, there's this small but definitely present in the, in, in the topos throughout each of the sources, even from proponents of the directive, which we didn't anticipate. So we suspected that there would be language of freedom used by them, but more just to dismiss it, to say there's not a concern of freedom of expression or censorship, for example. And whilst that was definitely present, as I mentioned earlier, um, the more prevalent and interesting form of discourse was the repurposing of the language of freedom. Um, and this certainly doesn't correspond with the same sentiments, but more interestingly, the result is that the top line becomes sort of muddled and absorbed by proponents of the directive rather than being a clear line of argumentation adopted by opponents. And very lastly, you can see that when it comes to the European and European cultural values, this was completely absent in the arguments by opponents in the European Parliament. Um, and we knew that sort of from the outset of frequency tables. Um, so for example, the, in the European Parliament, um, supporters of the directive mentioned terms like European and culture over 50 times, whereas opponents only had used it five times. So there's quite a stark difference here, and clearly it's a line of argumentation you're more likely to adopt if you're supporting the directive. 
So these are already quite exciting findings. So the value gap, I think we all would have suspected. You know, we know this dominated the, the discourse. But what we found on the freedoms is very interesting that the, you know, the, the, the actual the proponents absorbed a discourse which started on the other side, which is rhetorically very interesting. And um, on the European uh, uh, topos, it's also very interesting um, in that essentially European identity has been handed over in the discourse to, to, to the proponents. So how did this change over time? Um, this is really a stylized uh, representation. Um, so we just assigned you know, values in, in a spreadsheet to it and uh, discourse normally shouldn't be represented in this kind of form. But I think the, the, the kind of general movement uh, uh, you have to demonstrate in some ways. Um, so you can see that um, you know, the te technocratic language disappears as something which is important. Um, the freedom language, you know, emerges and becomes the most important discourse. And in the process of being becoming important is absorbed by the, the proponents. The value gap is there all the way through um, as, you know, very, very important. And um, the European discourse kind of gets uh, here linked to the value gap uh, discourse. So that uh, also, I think, is a very interesting finding. So this is our analysis of the, of the discourse. So what does it tell us about the public sphere? What does it tell us about the big theoretical picture we are trying to investigate? A difficulty is how do you make this link between the discourse and, and the changes in the law. So how do you articulate, uh, which is not a causal relationship, um, how do you articulate um, the assumption that uh, the conditions for a public sphere matter for the legitimacy of the law adopted? Um, and here we make you some suggestions how you might do that. So this is look specifically at, at Article 13. So if you look here at um, content recognition technologies, um, Amy already mentioned that this language, you know, which was in the public's mind associated with filtering systems, uh, was removed and uh, replaced with a different language. But the effect remained exactly the same. So if the obligation on the platforms on this new subcategory, um, the online content sharing service providers, if the obligations are there either to be liable or to um, um, remove, then you can only do this um, uh, if you have a mechanism to to filter. So um, therefore the removal of the language uh, did not change the effect of the of the um, words in law. Um, on on users, again, I think there is a, a quite important change that the initial draft had no uh, user exceptions, um, and there in 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 the, in the adopted directive we have under 17.7 um, uh, non mandatory uh, exceptions for the first time in European law, um, and uh, this is yeah, for quotation criticism uh, and review and uh, for um, use uh, for the purposes of caricature, parody, and pastiche. Um, that was not there before, and this is an important change. But again, the question is, how is this operationalized in the in implementation phase? And if you look there, um, so the freedoms may be there, but how are they preserved? How are they, is the redress a, a mechanism? Um, and one of the ideas that you, as a user, when you upload, you flag whether you think you fall under an exception, um, that would be a way of operationalizing it in, in a way that's meaningful. Um, uh, but I don't see a big chance that that will now appear in the uh, German implementation. Um, it was in the draft, but uh, again, the, the, the same dynamics seem to happen at national level as at European level. And then lastly, um, on the, um, what is the, uh, within the scope of the new obligations, um, so the carve out for, for smaller platforms and also the, the long list of exclusions, that really made a big difference. So removing um, Wikipedia, GitHub, and um, eBay, and uh, Dropbox, and um, so, so uh, and, and the startups, as long as they reach uh, not uh, um, 10 million uh, euro turnover, um, these are important changes. Okay, so so we would, from looking at what we see here, we would say uh, the changes one and two um, 
there are window dressing changes depending on two uh, depends on the implementations just been pushed to implementation on three um, there there's a substantive change so that this course could be be said to be reflected in the change in the law so this is our concluding slide and what you see here is really our, us struggling with this particular issue so how do we link the, the discourse to the lawmaking what is our conclusion here initially we said you know um, the failure of the public sphere was our initial t title for this um, paper um, but um, as we went through the process you know we could actually see that um, the topoi raised in public discourse did make a difference um, it did make a difference uh, but they made them in a very kind of complex way so both for this process of absorption and also carve outs um, there there is no one-to-one uh, um, -one relationship between the discourse and, and 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 the law so this would be something where we would be very interesting in hearing contents uh, comments on on uh, how to um, present you know this really quite complex picture you know is there a european public this uh, sphere well over to you Thank you very much for this for this fantastic uh, fantastically appealing paper.